Paul, still trying to deceit proof the Christians of Colossae. As if he's trying to work damp proofing into a wall with a brush, but he's actually working, you know, truthfulness and deceit proofing the people by really working it in with a brush. And he's concentrating them on Christ, isn't he? Repeatedly in that passage. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ, like this. Da, 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 da. External rules, then he says, ritual and religion, not the way. And it is important in my book that we're quite clear with people. That ritual, religion, and rules are not the way. Now that's born on my study, out of my study of Scripture, it's born out of my experience of God, and it's born out of what I do day in, day out, and trying to talk to people about the Lord and bring them to know Him. Because the biggest problem we've got here, now, is the perception that what we're about is ritual, religion, and rules. And relics. Relics. Yeah, well, we'll stick around the ritual or something. We'll find another <laughs> half for that. Because I haven't got relics in this passage. I have no warrant to run there. We'll do that another day this week. Relics. Oh, no. <laughs> I know where I'm going from. It. Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm too tired and distracted at the moment to manage otherwise. Sorry. Just, no, feel free to chip in. I'll pick up wherever I was. Where was I? Oh. So, of course, there are going to be those in Colossae who say to Paul, you're being very negative. We don't want to hear that. Perhaps they kindly suggest he takes a holiday because obviously he needs one if he's being that negative, you know? <laughs> oh, what a nice thought. Well, he was being negative. Because when there's stuff that's wrong and there's doing damage and causing harm, what are you going to be? Well, you're either going to acquiesce in it and be part of it, or you're going to say it's wrong. Pack it up. And there is a time when you are dealing with strongly asserted positions and practices that are irredeemably wrong. You have to say, no, 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 no. Not the way. And I think there's a reluctance to do that in Wales. I see a tremendous reluctance. And I wonder why. Is it the desire to be liked? You don't get far as a Christian if you're, if you're imprisoned by a desire to be liked. Do you? Is it, is it a, a, an innate insecurity? Isn't Jesus enough to take care of us? If we have to say from time to time, that's wrong. And then, rationally and reasonably, as Paul does, show why, and show, show the foolishness of it all. You don't get much more negative, the way that's defined in than Isaiah, as he's talking about idols. Is that Isaiah 43? You know, you're joking. You lot, you take a lump of wood. With part of it, you make a little idol. You burn and you worship it. You say, my God, it's my God. And the other bit warms your pot. Makes your cup up. There was time for that. And helping people see the uh, internal contradictions of their position. And that's what Paul is doing today. In this passage in Colossians. Colossians 2, 16 to 23. He's doing it, he's being negative, to deceit proof those who are the people of God. So whenever they can, Paul, John, Peter, the biblical authors, speaking under inspiration in general, they balance commendation and condemnation. Commending anything they can that is good and right before seeking to correct false practices or false teaching which seriously threaten the health and integrity of the people and the work of God. That's what false doctrine does. It is serious. Now you get a classic example of that. Can you think of a classic example of that in Scripture? I'm glad to see you've all been reading Revelation recently. Because there in the first two, well, chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, you've got a classic example of these churches. Paul writes to Smyrna and Philadelphia. And he says, look guys, this is great about you, but this, <laughs> get on top of this. And he writes to one church where he can't find anything positive to say. 
You are lukewarm, he says to the church in Laodicea, just up the road from Colossae, where these teachings are in the environment. And by the time John, later on, writes that letter to Laodicea, he's saying, look, I wish that you were either hot or cold, you're lukewarm. Terrible indictment. Lukewarm for Jesus. I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you're neither hot or cold, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You can't use words like that in a sermon. Yes, you can. He says, I'm going to pick you up. Interesting that they're in that thought world, in that culture, just down the road there, and the like is funny, where Paul is warning these Colossians against this heresy that's going to eat away at their life and their relationship with Christ, and a little while later on, in the same sort of environment, we don't know, but it's interesting... But John then has to write, on behalf of the Spirit of God, you're neither lukewarm, you're lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. Your spiritual life has been enervated. The guts have been taken out of it. All this emphasis of in Christ that Paul is trying to make has been lost. And the fires are gone out. And the hearth is cold. Things common, though slightly differently demonstrated, in Welsh church life threatening the church life at Colossae. And it's hard sometimes then to be positive, isn't it? One of the things Paul comes down on warns the Colossian Christians about in no uncertain terms. Three things, as the passage progresses, ritual, religion, and rules. I have three points, and they all begin with R. <laughs> More than that, Paul warns against letting anyone judge us on the basis of those three things. Now tell me that ain't relevant in Wales today. Let's have a look at it. Ritual, verses 16 to 17. Back in verse 8, Paul's first major warning to these Colossian believers, threatened by false teachers, was this. The warning was this. Do not let anyone take you captive. That was the first big warning in verse 8. Now comes the second one in verse 16. Do not let anyone judge you. How about that? First of all, don't let anyone take you captive to all these daft ideas. Secondly, don't let anyone judge you. Now, right at the very beginning, let me point out here, He's not saying, don't judge anyone. There's loads of that all across Scripture. The Lord Jesus teaches not to judge anyone else's servant, right? Scripture says, judge not that you be not judged. This is not that. This is something else. This is, do not let anyone judge you. See, it's the other direction. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Because that's fundamental. That is absolutely crucial. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink with regard to a religious festival. New moon, Sabbath, Sabbath, uh, new moon celebration on a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that will come. The reality is found in Christ. Do not have any truck with those people who judge you by Shadowlands values. Don't let them judge you. <laughs> That's sticking your neck out, isn't it? Oh, excuse me. What did you do? Judge me. That ain't going to last. That's going to be a smoke pile. Forget that. Here's the second major warning. It is crucially important, not just that you do not judge, but that you do not let others who call themselves brother to you, judge you on the basis of things like this. Because of what it perpetrates in the church of God. You have a duty of a responsibility to those who judge you and seek to judge you in this way. Is that fascinating? I could stop now and have a cup of coffee, because that is just an amazing thing. Well, because of all the things Paul has been saying in the preceding verses, about the effectiveness of Christ's cross, to pay the price of the Christian's sin, and to set me free from sin and death and hell, and drag me back from the verge of bondage to the fear of death again, he says, on the basis of those things, because of the cross, because you're a saved sinner, because, you could use Romans, couldn't you? Because there is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but then judge you, because that would be to unproclaim the gospel. Is that, is that adding up? That makes sense. If the hosts of hell can get you or others to doubt that what Christ has done on the cross is enough to pay the price of sin, to set you free from death and hell, then those same forces of darkness have done their work. 
Because salvation is by grace through faith alone in Him and what He's done. And if you doubt it, it's undone. In that sense. Don't undoes me. Do not let anyone judge you go to the heart of preventing the biggest objective of the hosts of hell against the individual believer. Not letting them judge you on things that don't matter preserves the effectiveness of cross cross, death on our behalf, salvation by grace through faith alone. That's how important it is. Don't take it on the chin, he says. Don't walk away. Don't just shrug it off. No, we don't do that. Because this goes to the heart of the effectiveness of Christ's death, the price he's already paid, the areas in which that is effectively done have been spelled out already in the preceding verses. Don't let him do it. How do we have to work that out? What areas do we have to work out that truth of Christ's sufficiency of Christ's death on the cross by grace through faith alone for me? Well, we work it out in these areas. Ritual, religion, and rules. So those things, ritual, religion, and rules, they are the instruments of the hosts of hell to undo the salvation of those who appear otherwise to profess faith and be saved. Whose work is ritual, religion, and what was it? Rules doing? causing condemnation of those who are already saved. It's doing the devil's work, isn't it? Who would believe that? Does that surprise you? <laughs> it's a testimony to the extent to which Wales has been rendered devoid of a good, faithful, thoughtful Bible teaching ministry. You know me, I'm all for sort of evangelism and church planting, yeah? Oh, we need some Bible teaching in Wales. And Wales has got this big name for Bible teaching, hasn't it? To preserve this gospel truth in its effectiveness and power. And that, it's a testimony to how much we need that, that this thought is such a surprise to quite so many Welsh Christian men and women. I'll rebuke myself for that. Let's try and make amends. Don't let them judge you for food. Now some of you, I'm sure, find it a what? Matthew Bible movement. I've been attending to my diet recently and uh, I'm happy to say yes, it's having a great effect. Thank you very much for asking. Um, you've got to watch what you eat, haven't you? Well, we've got a food scientist in our midst, you know, you've got to try, haven't you? Um, so, so here we are, trying. And uh, the Bible says, don't let anybody judge you on the basis of food. Is it talking about dieting and health? No, prob probably not. Probably not. We know that there was a big Jewish element in the heresy that was being propagated in Colossae. We know that. And we know that in the early church there was a great fuss about food in general, whether Christians should eat meat, all that stuff at the Council of Jerusalem, you know, leading up to Acts 15, the letter to the churches, whether they should eat meat. And then in 1 Corinthians, whether they should eat meat that had been offered to idols at the local shrines and all the rest of it, because that was getting sold at the butchers, as if, you know, Derry down the road had a butcher shop full of stuff that had been offered to idols, other than the idols, of materialism that is. Uh, so, uh, so, food was a big issue. Paul's saying, look, don't let them judge you. Now, I've got a very uh, wide circle of friends, which I'm deeply grateful, in all sincerity. And the vegetarian carnivore debate in that wide circle of friends can get quite heated. Right? It can be an issue. I guess that's the nearest comparable issue in our day, and, and the situation to the kosher food, food offered to idols debates that rage in the early church. Should you or shouldn't you eat meat at all? You know? But it's surprising to know, this is an interesting one, would it surprise you to know there are opposing but very strongly held views on that subject even within this small congregation? Even here. I'd be thrilled if it surprises you to know that. And the reason I'd be thrilled is it shouldn't be a matter of vigorous dispute between us. And Paul is saying, don't let anybody judge you on that. The blood of Christ, the power of the blood of Christ, far too wise. To, to kindle, we're being far too wise to kindle some sort of dispute based on this that would cast the blood of Christ and its effectiveness in death, judging one another on the basis of food. Even in this livestock farming area, where passions could run high on these matters, we preserve our faith in the effectiveness of Christ's death once for all for sin by not passing judgment on one another in these matters on food. The cruelty we're all against, unhealthy lifestyles, again I'd probably say we're probably all against, at least in principle. But we don't pass judgment on each other 
and what we eat or do not eat, and imprison consciences in that way because of the blood of Christ, because of the effectiveness of his cross. We don't allow anyone to judge us on food. Is there more hot potato coming up? Are you ready? Oh, food, hot potato. <laughs> Caleb's cooking. Booze. Oh, we don't judge one another on the basis of booze. Do not let anyone judge you, says Paul, by what you eat or what you drink. We don't allow anyone to judge us on food. We don't allow anyone to judge us and cast Christ's sacrifice into doubt on the things we do or don't drink either. Now stop there. We are not talking about addiction. We are not talking about the extent to which we do or do not eat or drink both. Let me show you. Therefore do not let anyone judge you by food or by whose. What you eat or drink, not how much you eat or drink. Does that make sense? We've certainly had the privilege of serving in churches where people have had addictions to both food and drink. Not both at once necessarily, but you know, different people, different problems. It's serious. Oh, it's, oh, it's a fierce, powerful, awful thing. We're not talking about that here, says Paul. It's not how much, it's what you eat or drink. That's the issue. This is not about the issues of excess or addiction that can be associated with the consumption or the non-consumption of alcohol, because you can be excessive about not having it. This is about normal, sensible, rational use. And some will choose to do that, and some will not. There appear to be very nice, plausible people around in the church of Paul's day, making trouble about what other sadly saved believers were or were not drinking. Now it's safe to say the early church was troubled by those we're trying to enforce refraining from alcohol if you're a Christian. We know this from Paul's advice even to the outstanding young Christian leader, Timothy. Timothy had perhaps been caught up in it. And Paul says to him, 1 Timothy 5, Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water. People don't get that. There's a run through there. Don't share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Now, of course, biblically there are lots of prohibitions and addiction and excess, but this is the biblical position. Do not allow anyone to judge you by what you eat or drink. There are problems to be encountered, aren't there, when anybody tries to enforce upon us or tries to assert that they are being any holier than Jesus was. Have you come across people who want to be holier than Jesus? I wrote an article ages ago for, I think it was EM or something about the vegetarian issue, because I was keeping outdoor pigs at the time, and it had become known. And uh, I wrote, wrote this article about, you know, not being holier than Jesus. Jesus sent me. Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands all the time, according to the ritual. And Jesus not only drank wine, he made it. Jesus made wine. I mean, he didn't do it with a bucket and that sort of thing, did he? A lot of fruit, you know. There was a very famous wedding, and you know all about it in John chapter 2. You know, what are we going to say then? Don't let anyone judge you by food or by booze. Because of the blood of Christ. Now, it may be booze, certainly what you drink. It, it's possible that there were regards, uh, there were um, Jewish uh, extra-biblical requirements about ritually clean drinking water. I had a Jewish friend that probably told you many years ago in college who, who would come and have coffee with me, but he had to wash my kettle up first because my water was unholy Gentile water. I did bat an eye if he wants to wash my kettle for me, that's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, he'd wash it out every time before he'd have it. It's fine. Maybe something like that. But certainly the principle is there. Don't let anybody judge you on the basis of what you eat or drink. See above. And live in the freedom for which Christ has set you free to. And the same can be said, not only of your ritual, but, uh, well, in terms of your the food, your booze, and your festivals. What you eat or drink, and with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. There's the stuff from this Jewish Sabbath in that picture on the wall. Do you see that? Looks as if these people afflicting the Colossian church with their false teachings were combining aspects of Greek philosophy with prognostic mystery religious experience and Jewish rituals. And these were these new moons and Sabbaths. That's where all this was 
coming from. It was a real syncretistic hodgepodge mess, throwing ritual together from all sorts of sources, calling unclean people Christ had made clean. And God has declared on the basis of their salvation by grace through faith alone, they're clean. They're being judged as unclean. All of these stupid things. Now look, in order to bring this right into our own experience, I'm going to risk trivialising this, possibly quite considerably, but trivial things are actually what this is all about. It's overblowing trivial things and forming judgments or allowing judgments to be formed about you on this sort of basis. Paul is warning against for these Colossian Christians. So, let me ask you this. Are divisions made amongst evangelicals in Wales on the basis of which festivals you do or do not go to? Our modern equivalent of new moons and Sabbath. Are judgments made about a person's being one of us or not, on whether you went up to the feast or not? Which feast? Ah, oh, Bala for ministers, of course. I go. Do you? I go. I love it. <laughs> it's great. Did you go to Bala? Oh, no. No, no. Oh. Doesn't need to be said. No more needs to be said. Oh, you go to Bala. Doesn't for ministers, of course, that's the case. But what about you know for the poor mortals? Where do the tribes go up? Well, the tribes go up to Aberystwyth, don't they? For ordinary mortals, conference every year. Did you go to the conference? No. Is that how it goes? Don't let anyone judge you over food, booze, or festivals, says Paul. And this is a gospel issue. This is a gospel issue. I know. There are individuals in churches in Wales this morning who feel inferior from the people who are with them around them in the pews because they were they would have got to look to our house. Don't let people judge you on this basis, says Paul, because this is a gospel issue. The issues that these people are seeking to judge you on, uh, food and, and booze and, and festivals, these are not gospel issues. But not allowing those people to judge you for those things, that is a gospel issue too. You are not to allow it to be done to you. This is a not, not a case of respecting the frail consciences of the weak. Biblically, we are to be sensitive to that, try not to use our freedom of conscience in a way that's going to cause a weaker brother or sister to stumble. This is not that which Paul is dealing with in Colossae. This is scruple being shown by the allegedly strong. Scruple being shown by the allegedly superior. And that's where the problem arises, says Paul. Do not allow them to judge you for these things, because that strikes at the effectiveness of Christ's death on the cross for your sin, and your acceptance. Not with a tribe. But in the glorious company you'll stand amongst the heavenly realities and sing the song of the Ritual observance. No use in putting you right with God. And we knew that, of course, because we are reformed evangelicals. Didn't we? Ritual. Obviously no use in putting you right with God, but letting yourself be judged and put down by anyone on the basis of even reformed evangelical rituals, whether you participate or not participate in their ritual observances, is also a gospel denying practice. Do not allow it. I think that might be possibly a bit more of a surprise for us. Don't allow yourself to be judged on the basis of ritual, nor of our second R, which will go more quickly, religion. Don't allow yourself to be judged on the basis of religion. Put religion down here, I should possibly have used the word religiosity instead. Because it's religious people and what they get up to that, that Paul's talking about here. Don't let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. See, there's the religious bit. Such a person goes into great detail about what they have seen in the context of their religion. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. And what have they done? They've lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Ironically, their religion has distanced themselves from the God that they're talking about, but have been separated.
The issue is disqualification, and the perpetrators of it are personal, and the way it happens is by means of religion. And you can spot them. Here's how. You can tell an awful lot about somebody by what they delight in. Verse 18. Anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels. I found myself standing listening to somebody recently talking about some of their problems. And I almost caught myself putting my head on one side and nodding like that. Do you know what I mean? Almost caught myself. As if in false humility I was going to listen to that. Do you know If you ever see me do anything like that, you just, just kick hard at my shins. Low down, okay? Because <laughs> I really want to mean it. I really don't want to go there. Is this false humility? Hmm. Do you know what I'm sort of thing? Oh, as if we're afflicted with their affliction. Mm. Professional caring. Watch. Mm. See that? There's this falseness about it all. And I just say, oh man, that's, that's rock hard. That that's horrible. I overcorrected myself perhaps the other way. I don't know. But do you see the point? Religiosity. False humility. False humility is hypocrisy, isn't it? The doctor was said on one occasion to have commented on the uh, appointment of a new Roman Catholic Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, where, um, because they were sort of just down the street from one another, where their chapels were. Um, <laughs> he was asked what he thought about the appointment, he said, such a nice man. You can tell by the way he puts his head on one side. <laughs> now, there is this problem, is there not? Certainly it's a professional problem for the clergy, or the religious, with false humility, don't delight in it. False humility, foul, says Paul. And Paul the ex-Pharisee knew all about it, of course, because of his background. And then there's the worship of angels. How ridiculous is that? The worship of angels subverts the divine image in man's innate inclination to reach out to its creator. We, we, we worship by nature because of the way God has made us. Because he is our creator and we're his creature. But it takes that tendency and it redirects worship from the creator to created beings. It is idolatry because it subverts the first and greatest commandment. It takes that desire to worship and instead of focusing it on God, it focuses, focuses it on his creation, his creature, the angel. And do you know where I came across this most recently? In the co-op. In the co-op in Plant Dylan. With a very Christian person who's been reading some book and has got completely taken up with angels instead of the God who made them all. Sort of substitution thing. We get so focused on, you know. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's, that's a bit of a shock on it. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, it was. I was thinking the car. Bonkers. What we delight in is very revealing about us. These people delight in all these things, the worship of angels. And they delight in details. They delight in detailed relishment of personal experience, detracting from biblical teaching and truth. They, they want to go into great detail about what they've seen, their visions, and their prophecies, and their details. Where's Jesus? Oh, he's back there. Um, do you see? There's distraction going on again. Now, look, it's not a mistake what I am saying. Our, our own biblical experience of God is absolutely crucial, isn't it? Experience is crucial to us. Christ has taken sin out of the way, and therefore we know Him again. We know God again. It's crucial. We have an experience of God. That's fantastic. But we're not delighting in all the details of my experience. Because what happens is it all gets focused on me again. And we've got to come back to the heart of worship, which is Him. Not my, you know, whatever's been... Passing through my head, Paul says, they go into great detail, they, they pumped up with idle emotions in their, uns, in their unspiritual mind. Their experience of God. Very quickly you spot it is not about him, it's about them. And they're off on one. And churches are getting glory for Jesus, but the churches are full of people getting attention and glory for themselves. And watch it, says Paul. 
They're purporting to be ever so spiritual, but for the reasons already stated, they have unspiritual minds because they're getting away from Jesus. And they're being very puffed up with a sense of their own importance, not his. See above, says Paul. Actually, thinking about it, they're glorifying themselves, the creation, rather than the God, the creator, and they're really getting into being another type of idolatry again, aren't they? You can get close to it. Disconnected from the God you should be glorifying, but are instead alienating, and being alienating from, because of your idolatry. Of these experiences in your own, in your own experience. Ritual, religion, and rules. Rules. We don't need to do much with this because we've been over this ground repeatedly, haven't we? Because we've been through Galatians. We've spent time in Romans. We know we're not put right with God by any other means than by grace through faith alone. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. That and not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works so that no one should boast. For we have God's work which it created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he has prepared for us to walk in. We know that, don't we? We know these verses. We, we're aware of this issue. But rules keep on popping up. And people keep trying to judge you on the basis of rules. Two years ago I stood up in a minister's conference because all the ministers were trying to judge younger ministers because they're not appearing in their time. This is why I'm unpopular. This is wrong. This becomes a gospel issue. When rules are applied in this way. Judging one another on the basis of rules. Now you've heard me preach in a time. You've heard me preach out of a time. Mercifully, you've normally seen me preaching a shirt, which is good, isn't it? <laughs> but that's for other reasons. Does it affect the preaching much? You can have a duff one with a tie on or a duff one without a tie on. It comes the same way, doesn't it? Paul is speaking with authority from his own experience because he knows about rules-based religion. He knows it very well indeed from the inside out. Having grown up as a teenager, a young man, and as a teacher within the extreme rules-based approach of first century Phariseeism. And he can speak with authority on the subject, and the first thing he says about it is that it is very worldly. It pretends to be complete opposite. It pretends to be extremely spiritual, but it is very worldly, says Paul. This is a bit of a shocker. The whole point of Phariseeism was to make heavenly religious life accessible to the ordinary people by making clear rules, do's and don'ts for everyday life. The trouble is, it became something of a growth industry. So arguably you have to be rich enough to go into their study, you have to know about them, let alone to do them. Paul is saying, far from being concerned with a heavenly spiritual objective, his experience of such things, this rules-based religion, seems pretty close to the stuff being peddled at philosophy, was that these rules and its, 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 its observance was all very good. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. It's all very worldly. Their purpose and their subject matter is material, physical, this worldly. This is ironic. Because the stuff the proto-Gnostic teachers afflicting the church at Colossae were supposed to despise was this material stuff, this, this worldly stuff. And look at the focus they're playing on. Here, says the Apostle, is the big problem with that. It's worldly because of the stuff it deals with. And because it's worldly and because it belongs to this world, it's all to do with stuff that's going to go up in smoke, verse 22. It's perishing. It's perishing. By the grace God has given me, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. Someone else is building on it. Each one should build with care. No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. See, back to that again. Now, if anybody builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with a match. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. 
We need to trust that it is worthwhile to spend what we have now to gain what we trust God to deliver to us there and then. This is the nature of living biblical faith. And if you're trusting Him with what you've got now in your hand and investing it with Him for the future when you can't see it. What are you going to build with? Well, you need to build for the future. You need to trust to do that. But more than that, you need to invest in the appropriate coinage. You don't see anybody walking into Lloyd's or Barclays in Chandala with a bale of hay or straw on their shoulder, do you? Well, maybe you have. <laughs> but they were just generally passing. They weren't making a deposit of that. Lamb under their arm? Put this in my account, will you? Certainly not, sir. Go away. Hide the heads. No chance. The point Paul's making is there'll come a point in real time when the things we've done for the Lord will have to be in the appropriate kind. They'll have to be his thing, and they'll have to be the genuine thing. Okay, so by the grace of God, I trust we can all point to people who've learned Christ, or been helped to learn Christ from us. And who are going on with the Lord, and bearing fruit for eternal life. I trust, trust we can see that. I'm sure every one of us will find too. There have been things we feel we've been able to do for the Lord that we felt, then or later, were really God at work, but that have turned out a bit different on closer or longer examination. No, actually, that was strong. But Paul is saying that this rules-based religion is all straw. And it's all about things that are perishing. And things that will be consumed that is not only worldly by nature, but perishing in the long run. And, in the present, it does nothing to help. It's useless. Such regulations, verse 23 have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. You know that very well. You don't need me to spell that out for you. You don't need me to tell you how much you love it when somebody tells you, a mature adult, what you should do and how you react to that. And you don't need me to tell you how easy you find it to do the things that you're told you should do anyway. Not very useless. In restraining sensual indulgence. So, by way of conclusion, is that the word you're waiting for? By way of conclusion, those things, the ritual, the religion, the rules, they are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality is found in Christ. Don't let anybody judge you on that basis. Then. There's nothing there. Have you noticed how sinful human beings prefer life in the shadows to life in the light? That's the problem here. They were hiding away and pretending to be a lot more than they were, the sort of people who are only secure when it's acknowledged that they are better than them. And ritual and religion and rules do that for you. They give you that place to hide away. And certainly if you can focus the attention on somebody else by judging them on the basis of ritual, rules and religion, then you'll be really hiding very effectively. That's very good camouflage and concealment for one's own inadequacy. Ritual, religion and rules do that for you by presenting a fair face to the world that covers the corruption that's rampant within. The fire's coming, says Paul. Those heretics of Colossi preferred life hiding in shadow land to life in the open, out in the light. Magnifying the grace of God in the gospel to sinners by being very open and clear and plain about their own sin and their own need of a saviour. Their dependence on his grace day by day. When defective repentance leaves the chopped roots of sin lying in a life, and I'm thinking here of the thorny ground in the parable of the soils, there are lots of murky things available to propagate themselves downstream of a profession of faith in Christ, maybe of formal membership in a church somewhere. And shadows soon come to seem preferable to people who've got weeds growing up. Preferable to stark, simple Christian reality. What are the leading features of Shadowland? Where people hide their sin instead of repenting of it and finding mercy in grace. Firstly, that willingness to judge. That's a leading distinctive of life in shadow. And a fascination with ritual and religion and rules which are actually of no value in restraining sensual indulgence but hide them from the outside. 
A fascination that actually cuts you off from God, not unites you with Him, in whom are all the riches of God. And for these reasons, the Apostle Paul, for these reasons, the Bible, see ritual and religion and rules based living as utterly demonic. Because they do the devil's work as they cut you off from God. And that's why it's important, says Paul, that you do not let anyone judge you on the basis of these things if you have been put right with God by grace through faith alone and a living life united with Him. I'm afraid I've had a problem this week and I haven't been very well. I haven't been very clear in my thinking. And if any of that's not any clear, just we'll have a cup of coffee and we'll have a chat, okay? If I've made anything muddier than it ought to be. But I just hope that God can take his word and can help us with it. Uh, and help us to grow in him and to be closer to him so that it might, as we go out, be much more about him. Because it is all about you, Jesus. In the words of the popular song, we love Shall we pray? Lord, we just thank you that your word is so good for us. We thank you that it meets our need. We thank you that it deals with the things that afflict our souls and afflict the state of your church and long for your church. We, we love your church. We long that your church in this land might have access again to your truth, that you gather the flock that's been scattered around yourself, around the feet of Jesus, and that we might come closer to him again that we might be more used so that the ritual and the religion, the rules and everything else serves to cut us off from him who is our head. Might be banished from the place. And there might be a fresh burst of life in the people of God. Start here, Lord, please start with me. Start with us. Start with your church in this land and reach a world that's without Jesus, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen.